right, I think we'll make a start. Uh, kia ora koutou, um, called Chris Walker Toko Ingoa. Uh, I'm Chris Walker, I work for NCDI Te Rero. It's um, our pleasure to have you join us this afternoon for this session on returning to school through love and care. And um, I'm sure many of you with us today have been back in your schools and in your classrooms today. And uh, the Tamariki have been joining you and you've been interacting with families. And, uh, you know, well, there's been a lot of, um, of uh, pleasure in that. There's, there's un bound to have been some, some stress as well for you and for the students and, and for colleagues. And uh, today I think will be really helpful in helping you kind of work through in a really practical way some things that you can be doing in your schools and classroom that are going to help everyone move from what's been you know a very kind of unusual and unsettling time into some patterns which are going to help people um, feel settled feel appreciated feel loved and feel cared for uh, so with classrooms and schools physically reopening teachers will need to help children understand how the world's changed over the last few months so this webinar has some practical advice on how to manage that return to school and how to center on pedagogies that center love and care ensuring the emotional and mental well-being of children and school staff so the webinars for all educators um, helping you support uh, with transition back into school the panellists, who I'll give more full uh, introduction of later, include the University of Auckland's Professor Carol Munch and Professor Peter O'Connor. We have Linda Stewart, the principal of May Road School, and Marie Gallatin, a classroom teacher at Newton Central School. But before we go on, um, I'll just um, open our, our hui with the karakia. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, Kia ma taratara ki tai. E hi aki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hohu, ti he Māori order. And just before I um, run through a quick overview of what we'll do this afternoon, I came across uh, Whakatoki. Uh, one of my colleagues shared this with me this morning, and I thought I'll, I'll tuck that in my kite. That's appropriate for this afternoon. Um, and I think we might be able to flick it up on the screen uh, so you can all see. If not, we'll just carry on, that's fine. Um, me mahi tahi tato mō te auranga o te katoa. We work together for the well-being of everyone. And I thought that was very apt for what we were doing here this afternoon. All right, so just a quick overview of what we're going to do. Um, our four panellists are going to speak to you uh, the, this afternoon. And while they're doing that, no doubt you'll have questions or uh, that you might want to ask. Uh, down at the bottom of your um, of your screen there, of your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q and A button. So if you have questions as we go, please put them in there. We have a backroom team with us this afternoon as well of, of NZDI staff, uh, joined by some university staff as well. It's nice to have them uh, working collaboratively today, and they'll be kind of collating those questions so that we can address the the key areas of interest towards the end there, uh, and we'll have some time for that Q and A, and then we'll wrap up with a final statement from from our panelists. Uh, all right, so I think we can get into it. Um, so we're going to start off with, uh, I suppose, some of the, the big thinking behind uh, Torito Toy and how we go about returning to school with love and care. So our first speaker this afternoon is Professor Carol Munch, a professor of critical studies and education in the Faculty of Education and Social Work, and her focus uh, research focuses on disaster response and recovery. She's also the Education Commissioner for UNESCO New Zealand. So Carol, welcome. You just muted there, Carol. There we go. It's all done. Uh, kia ora koutou, everyone. Uh, Namahi nui, ko Carol Much. Aho. So uh, I'm starting. Sorry, now that I've, I've just lost my notes. Um, I'm starting because I just want to place what we've been through in the last two years in a, in a bigger picture so that you can think about where you've come from and where you are today and what you still have ahead of you. So for the past 10 years, I've been looking at, as you heard, the role of schools in disasters and crises 
And that started with the Canterbury earthquakes, but spread across uh, six different countries and a range of different disaster contexts and hundreds of interviews with principals and teachers and students and parents. And over the last two years, in particular, looking at um, how COVID-19 has impacted schools. And across my work, I've come up with four themes that seem to underpin everything that you do. And the first one is the way in which you as a school hold your community together. What, like, what I call being a community anchor. You're not just there for the educational purpose, but you're there to do all those extra things that help a school to uh, help a community to feel connected, to feel networked, to have somewhere that they feel like they belong. And the second one is how principals and their leadership teams sort of step up and become crisis leaders. And that's despite the toll that it takes on them. They take on this leadership mantle that's far and above what they've been prepared for. And similarly with teachers, they become frontline trauma workers. So as when students, as they did today, can come back to school, not only are they trying to balance, you know, what am I supposed to be doing in my role as a teacher alongside that? How am I caring for their well-being and making sure that their entry back to school is, is, is going to be right for them at this particular time? And then the fourth thing, which I probably won't talk about today because I think the rest of the program will talk a little bit more about this, is that our tamariki and rangatahi will come back to school possibly differently to the way that you might have, have um, expected. Some will have really thrived at home. Others would need to come back to school and have that social environment in which to thrive. And yet others might not have arrived back to school, uh, might have had um, you know, not such a good time at home. And it will take them some time to ease back into school because school, of course, isn't going to be as it was um, certainly in 2019. They've, they've had many ups and downs. So I want to quickly acknowledge the things that you've done. And I want to share just a few insights from my research. So I, I did mention the community support. Look, I am your biggest supporters. I know what you've been doing. I know you've been out there delivering food parcels and phoning up families that you haven't been able to get in touch with and lobbying with internet providers and so on. But I also want to acknowledge that some schools have had it harder than others. Not only do they already have a range of difficulties in their communities, but they faced the Lynn Mall attack and the West Auckland floods, what we kind of call cascading trauma. And this has brought an extra layer of um, how they're coping and supporting their communities. And then in the, in the crisis leadership, one of the things that my research has shown is that sometimes principals and leadership teams try to be superheroes. They think they have to carry everything on their shoulders, but it's really important that you take the support that's offered to you, whether you join with other like-minded people, whether you get support from your kahuiako, your board chair, your principal mentor, and so on. It's really important that you, you take that support and not try to do it all by yourself. And then teachers. Um, I mentioned that idea of, of trauma workers. What we know is that children aren't these single little vessels that you fill up with knowledge. They come with a whole lot of baggage. They come with things that have happened in their past lives, in their previous school, and their family lives, and so on. And school is the safe place that they come to. And it's really important that you acknowledge that you're trying to do an awful lot, not just the literacy and numeracy, but also um, helping them deal with the smaller traumas and the larger ones such as COVID-19 and so on that they're going to face. And then finally, when these um, our tamariki and rangatahi do come back, the way to enable them to really re-engage and to be able to look forward with sort of positivity and critical hope is to go gently. And so if, if there's a message I can give you today, it's don't make assumptions, just spread that afi and aroha, make your school a joyful place, make it inviting and inclusive. And through all of that, I want you to be kind to yourselves because I'm going to end with a poem. Um, in my recent research, I took, um, I've just, 
did an, uh, done an article about uh, teachers and uh, how they've coped with COVID-19. And I took their transcripts and I took out little snippets of what people said and I turned it into what's called a found poem. So these are not my words, these are teachers' words. And I've got two voices here. I've got the voice of here am I coping, I know what to do, I've got all the advice. And then on the other side, I've got what it was really like. So I'm going to conclude with this poem because I want to acknowledge that this is what your life has been like. You've been living in these two worlds of the sensible, I can do this sort of world and the, oh my goodness, how did I cope world? So the poem is called, Just Soldier On. We were educators being given an opportunity to test the values we often talk about. Yeah, but that was mentally challenged. Just so many challenges, lots and lots of challenges. Oh, take it slow, take your time. Yeah, we're doing it for the first time. We'll make mistakes. We just need to learn from our mistakes. I felt really useless. Perhaps that's too harsh a word. I couldn't be there physically. And that was really hard because most of our job is just being there with them every day in their learning, in their lives. Oh, just deal with what's in front of you. You're a teacher, you're a professional, a facilitator of learning. There was only so much you could do. You were paid to be a teacher, but really there was only so much you could do. You just got to soldier on. Expect the unexpected. Work smarter, not harder. Don't try to be superhuman. Just do your best. You know you can make a difference. And I've never worked so hard. By the time I got back to school, I felt I hadn't had a break. I'd worked right through from term one to term three. I think what happened across many schools in the country our teachers, our support staff, everyone involved with the school just pulled together and did the best they possibly could. But it was tough. It was tough. It nearly broke me. Noreda, tenakoto, 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 kato. Kia ora, Carol. Thank you for that. I, and I think it, one of the things I took from that is that importance, not only that, that uh, teachers, support staff and principals have permission to work differently after this, but the importance of it. Um, and I was listening to RNZ this morning and heard a couple of school principals talk, and from the, from the same neighbourhood talking about the different ways that they were reopening their schools. And what I picked up from that was that they were, they'd both been so careful to be attuned to the needs of their community. Um, and so I, I can't really think of anyone better to talk about that than our next panellist. Uh, is Linda Stewart, uh, the principal of May Road School, also the immediate past president of NZDI Tiliaroa. And Linda's going to share her perspective as a principal on the return to school, having used um, Torito Toy resources during 2020, and now planning for a gentle and safe return across the school after this latest lockdown experience. Over to you, Linda. Uh, kia ora, Chris, and kia ora koutou, nga mihi nui ki a koutou, tau lau falawa, ma luilele, whakalau Bulavanaka, namaste, assalamu alaikum, and it's really, really lovely to be here with you all this afternoon. I have to say I want to do a huge shout out. I know it's to educators across the country because we've got um, people from all parts of the country on this webinar, but actually a huge shout out to those of you from Tamaki Makoto and from the Waikato who have opened your doors again for our pupils today. And I'm absolutely buzzing after the first day back with our kids. I cannot tell you what a privilege it is to do the role that I do. So I'm principal of May Road School, which is a little school in Mount Ross School, Central Auckland. Uh, we've got a large Pacifica community, so large Samoan community, large Tongan community, um, some Nuaeans, some Cook Island Māori, so Pacific Island nations are well represented. Growing Māori population, and then we have the United Nations, uh, little bits of the rest of the United Nations in the school. And um, just over 200 students, gorgeous school, great community, and I just want to do a huge, huge mihi to our staff because we have an amazing team of people, and Carol talked about that. You know, I couldn't do what I do without that team of people around me. Um, I have to say, with Torito Toy and with the use of Torito Toy and, and the timing of Torito Toy, for us it came in um, at that first lockdown experience. 
And our people have huge anxiety around COVID-19. We were, we were hard hit in 2020 and been hard hit in 2021 as well. So what happens for our people, and when I talk about our people, I'm talking about our community, um, they, they struggle. They struggle with housing issues in the area that I'm in. A lot of them are quite transient at the moment. So we've got people who are living in motels and um, they need the food packages and Carol talked about the sorts of things that, um, that, that we've been doing as a school because it is around ensuring that we're not just talking about the children here, we're talking about the whole, the whole child, which is all of their family, their eyeing of their whanau as well. Uh, so when children came back into school last year, we wanted to make it fun. We knew that for some of them, they had been living um, in places where their parents love them. There is no doubt about that. The parents do the best they can. But it's really, really hard when you're worried about the fact whether or not you're going to have a job next week or whether there's going to be food, whether you can provide for the family. It becomes really difficult. So when our kids came back to school, one of the things that we talked about as a staff was the fact that we were going to make it fun, that we were going to do things uh, differently, that it wasn't about reading, writing or maths. And that was actually a message that I sent out a number of times to our community. And we talked about a lot as a staff. It won't be the reading, writing or maths that our children do during this time. It will be the way we make them feel. So it's whether they feel safe, whether they feel secure, whether they feel well loved, that's the stuff that matters. So, you know, we, we have the digital divide, we have all that stuff that Carol talked about. So yes, we've been trying to get people um, devices and we've been trying to do, get the internet to places and all of that stuff. But when the children came back, we wanted them to feel safe. So to little toy was something that really, really helped us over that over that time. Now some teachers are really creative and some teachers are not as creative. It's not their natural bent. So Torito toy was something that could we could actually use to springboard um, ideas from. And I think the other part that was useful was over that time was teachers supported each other. So that was really, really important. So if if you know art's not your thing, drama's not your thing, then there's someone else to help you and to walk alongside you in that space. Um, because we know that for children, if you come to school and you're anxious, and these were the conversations that were happening last time round, and they've started today, this time round, where children are talking about the fact that they were worried that someone in their family would pass away with COVID-19. Someone would get sick they might pay, pass it on to someone else. And we have a number of our families who live in intergenerational homes. So for them, that's really, really real. And I know that um, the best way of actually dealing with anxiety is giving children the opportunity to talk about it. And we don't talk about it when we're doing a PAT test or a writing moderation. We talk about it when we're sitting right next to a child. Yeah, we might have that metre apart, but right next to the child and having a conversation with them. So having those experiences with art, with drama, with hearing stories, with having the opportunity to talk has been absolute magic for our children. What that does is it doesn't just strengthen the relationship with the child and the teacher or the learning assistant, but it actually strengthens the relationship with the family. And that's been so, so important. So through this time, what, what springs to my mind? Um, he aha te mea nui o te ao. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is about our people and that's so important. So what did I hear today? Today I heard laughter, I heard singing. As the kids came into school, we had Wally, our amazing librarian, has been dressing up every day, so 50 days or whatever it was, of Wally telling stories and then a few other um, smatterings of the cat in the hat and, and Grandma Nichols and other people who've been doing these videos for our kids. 
Um, so Wally was out the front with me and we had balloons, we had music and, and we just started rocking it right from the beginning of the day. Our kids came in, they came in sort of, they came in really happy to see us all. When I went around the classrooms, they were a little bit quiet to start the day, but they got noisier, I'm assured, by the end of the day. And um, what I got just before I came onto this was a beautiful email from one of our parents, and it said, our family is starting to reconnect again. And I thought, right, the day is done. The day is done. And I, I'm really proud of our people because that's, that's magic. Um, Norera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Jota, thanks for that, Linda. Um, and just a reminder to everyone who's joined us this afternoon, if you have any questions as we go through, please put those in the Q&A. Uh, but you can use the button at the bottom of your Zoom window for that, and we'll come back and have some time to ask questions of the panellists after they've spoken. Uh, and, you know, Carol's outlined the importance of, of uh, supporting students and their return to school and Linda's talked about some of those things about you know focusing on acknowledging stress and uncertainty and making things fun I suppose the good news is is that there is a wealth of research and material to support you as uh, teachers and educators in that work uh, a lot of that comes together under the umbrella of Torito Toy and our next panelist is going to talk about that more in a moment but first we're just going to show you a brief video just a kind of a minute and a half which will give you an introduction to um, some of the some of the material you can use. Toretta Toy was established during COVID-19. Its purpose really to help teachers and students return to the classroom following the disasters and crisis of the pandemic. It uses the arts as a way to re-engage with learning, to catch up not with work, but to catch up with each other, to establish an ethic of care, to establish a way of being with each other, which reinforces the notion that at the heart of all teaching is the human relationship. The possibility of using the arts to re-engage with the emotions, to re-engage with each other is vital for schools after crisis. Tarita Toy is research informed, practice led, designed with and alongside teachers and experts in arts education, trauma informed pedagogies. It's a one stop shop for teachers to think about how they're going to respond to the issues, the concerns, the worries, the anxieties of children as they return to school after life-changing events. When children come back after crisis, they need to come back to the joy and the wonder of learning. And it's the arts that provide that in a unique way. So we say, come back to school through the arts because that's the way back to living. Well, the voice you heard in that video um, is the, the voice of our next speaker, uh, Professor Peter O'Connor, who's an internationally recognised expert in making and research applied theatre and drama education. Peter's the director of the Centre for Arts and Social Transformation at the Faculty of Education and Social Work. And Peter led the creation of Torito Toy, which is the online resource that he'll talk about in a moment to support the return to school by, uh, by children post-disaster. Peter's most recent research includes multi and interdisciplinary studies on the creative pedagogies in the arts, the nature of embodied learning and the pedagogy of surprise. And as you saw in that little video, um, you know, both Carol and Peter uh, focused on the role of schools in disaster response and recovery following the Canterbury earthquakes. So Peter, welcome to our panel this afternoon. Oh, kia ora Chris, nā mihi nui a koutou. Um, it's been a strange and crazy couple of months isn't it uh, for those of us in Tamaki Makaro and Waikato and there's always the sense when schools go back that it's a marker of a return and um, those of us who've worked in Christchurch or those like Carol who live there know it's not a return to normal it's a return to something else 
um, and how we think about these four weeks before we go into our summer break, you know, the promise of freedom today at one o'clock. But that four weeks could in fact be some of the most important four weeks that our children ever spend at school. You know, after being locked away from each other, after being physically separated, although socially connected, perhaps, how they come back, how they imagine school might be, that when they come back, and if they come back and school is a place that they still feel excited about in four weeks' time, that they still have that buzz that they had this morning when they leave, and if we can hold on to that and bring them back next year, then we've done our job. So these four weeks are actually really important for us to get right. And it's not about catching up with lost learning as if that's a thing even, but it's about catching up with relationships. It's about not returning to routine, but returning to the rhythm and pattern of life and what that means, to the rhythm and pattern of playing with your friends, of discovering new things, of having fun, and recognizing that learning can be a joyful, wonderful process in itself. So these, the, the, these weeks are, are deeply important, are deeply important for us to get right. You know, when, when these children are my age, they'll be telling their grandchildren, during the pandemic in 2021, we went back to school for four weeks. And in that time, we had this amazing explosion of the arts. We had this incredible time where we really enjoyed being at school and it changed everything. Because when we went back in 2022, they carried on. They did the same thing. It was extraordinary. It was wonderful. The whole system changed. You know, this whole business of, of safe time and, you know, some of the research that we did last year, these extraordinarily anxious children about their grandparents and their parents and themselves. It's very different to last year. COVID's in the community. There are people dying. And they carry those fears into classrooms. And we run the risk of going back to routine and normality and denying that. And Linda nailed it. You know, it's you don't want to have classroom discussions about that. What you want to have is to be able to sit alongside a child while they're making beautiful things in the arts in parallel conversations, deep, rich conversations between adult and child about really important things. So Torito Toy really is what I said at the very beginning, a one-stop shop where you can go to. There are so many research-informed, research-led um, resources that you can just pick up and work with straight away with your kids. And we're going to have a look at just the first one. Um, so there's a slide about to come up. And that was the cue. So my good friends and colleagues at the Sir John Kerwin Foundation, who I've had the great pleasure of working with on a mental health program for primary schools for two years, have cre created this beautiful resource using the picture book, Tumeki Tuatara. A little kindness goes a long way. And it's gorgeous. If you look at the resource, um, you even get it um, narrated by, by the author. If we flick to the next slide, you can see why I think this is such a a wonderful resource. And at one level, it's not literacy and numeracy or. You can actually do the literacy and the numeracy and everything else, but you can do it in a different way. You can do it, especially through picture books. So, you know, um, this has got strong cross-curricular links to the arts, literacy, oral language, science, and social studies. But what it does is it provides opportunities through fiction to explore anxieties, feelings, and strategies to manage change in the uncertain world our corner find themselves. You know, in Te Reto Tour, you can find the most extraordinarily beautifully curated picture books that you can use to talk about really deep and important things with, with the children. If you could flick that back off, Kristen, that would be that would be wonderful. You know, there are some other ones that I just wanted to mention very briefly. Earlier this year, working with um, Dagmar uh, Dyke at Sylvia Park School, we created a gorgeous resource, making a kahoa kakala. And if you're working with large numbers of Pacifica children or not, but you want to engage in Pacifica art making where they make something which is actually a gift that they take home to their, to their ainga, to their whanau, it's the most beautiful resource. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's fun, it's beautiful, 
but it's also deeply meaningful. You could also look, if you wanted to, at the Ha'ora site of it, which is using a kopapa Māori approaches, Matauranga Māori approaches to well-being to explore those issues. And I know there's many of, of you on, on this side who are using um, stop, pause, breathe. Have a look at the way in which that's presented in the Ha'ora through Māori dance and movement and breathing and connection to, to, to wider notions of Māori cosmology. Um, they're there. Research formed and research led. And I know for some teachers, they're going to be challenged by parents, by their communities, and even unfortunately by senior leaders who want a different focus when schools go back. And what I would say is the other really good thing about Te Rito Toy is that all the research, which informs that this is actually the best way for schools to return is there. And if someone says you should be doing something else, share Te Rito Toy, the website, share the research, and say, well, actually, research tells us that when kids come back in these kinds of places, this approach, the gentle, loving, caring approach that Carol started this whole talk off is actually what makes the difference. We'll reconnect kids to each other. We'll reconnect kids to you, to their families. And what we're all about at schools, we'll reconnect them to their learning. I, I had a, a mentor and a guide who, uh, Dorothy Heathcote, who I had the great pleasure of working with. And she said that there are two questions that should guide what you do in a classroom. And if you have them in the front of your mind over the next week, it answers a lot of things. Do the things you do really matter? So do the, not do they count? Can you count them? That's a different question. Do they really matter? And it's the next one, her second question that I've always loved. And in doing that, do they know they matter? And that's the pedagogy of love and care that sits at the heart of Te Rito Toy. Like Carol, I'm in the war of the work of teachers. You know, it was the best decision I made in my life to become a teacher. My whole family are teachers. Um, it's the best, and I can only wish you the best over these four months. Look after yourselves, love yourselves, love your children, care for your children, and I'll echo Carol, Carol, care for yourselves. Make sure that when you get to that last day, whatever day that is in four weeks' time, you're all in one piece. Um, no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tata katoa. Kia ora, Peter. Thank you for that. Um, you know, as you say, it's an important four weeks, and you, what you started to talk about there was what we actually do in our in our schools and classrooms. Um, and our, our next panelist will speak to that. Marie Galishan is a classroom teacher at Newton Central School. She will share her perspective on the return to school after the lockdowns last year, where the focus was on well-being and the arts curriculum, and perhaps some reflections on how she intends to kind of, I suppose carry that on and, and change that up in the return from lockdown uh, this year. So thanks, Marie. Mm -hmm. Oh, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Marie, uh, toko ingoa. Uh, yeah, I'm a classroom teacher at Newton Central School, a little inner city school um, in Auckland. And of course, today we had our, um, I think it's our fifth um, return to school, I think. I'm thinking of other teachers down in Waikato as well. Um, so, uh, at school, our school last year, we made the decision, and ha happily we were really supported by our um, senior leadership as well in this, to um, focus on the arts and well-being following um, lockdown. And actually, that was for both our staff and students. It wasn't just our students; we were thinking about ourselves too. Um, so it's early days this time, but we do pretty much have the same plan. And uh, you know, last year we knew a little bit about Tiri Toy at that stage and we wanted the return to school to be a really gentle experience for the children. And, you know, like I said, for us as well. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, my um, own personal situation. I had a gorgeous arty teacher who was next door to me, really creative person. And she and I just set about um, planning just lots and lots of art activities for the Tamariki, you know, drawing and painting and sculpture and we made dioramas and construction and 
giant collaborative stuff too, um, as well as lots of sort of open-ended activities that encouraged um, drama and really imaginative play. Um, oh, by the way, we're, I'm a year two, three teacher now, and I was then too. So it's, it's that kind of age, not the really tiny ones, but um, uh, not the big old ones either. Um, but what we came to realise, and we sort of were making it up as we went along, I mean, most of us were, I think, at that point, but we came to realise just how important it was to keep their little hands busy. That, you know, as well as having um, opportunities to talk really explicitly, um, or through drama, about their experience of lockdown, just the act of participating in the arts was a path to well-being in itself. So yes, we did do talking about emotions and well-being, but it was just the doing. It didn't have to be about um, well-being. It was just, it didn't matter what, and we used their interests, of course, like we do when we're teachers. So yeah, we made it up as we went along, but um, this year I'm super excited to use the Te Toy activities more deliberately. We had teachers in our schools and our school that used them really well. Um, and it's my, I'm really looking forward to really diving in and they're, they're all there. They're right there for you. You don't, just like it was said, you don't have to be a super creative artistic teacher because it's all written out there for you. You can, and you can kind of follow it. Um, and what we noticed when they were doing art, drawing or painting or whatever it was, Play-Doh even, is that they would discuss lockdown and they would discuss COVID and they would discuss the return to school and how they were feeling. And they were doing it while they were making the art. So in their little tables, they would natter away like a sort of a sewing circle or something. Um, and we would see it in their dramatic play too. We would see their characters with problem solving issues or sort of expressing themselves. And it was really clear that they were sort of working through the experience of lockdown and the experience of the return to school, because it's not just being in lockdown, it's also that change back into school that is abrupt and, and you know, kind of confusing for them. So, and we thought it really worked for us. You know, we had the usual mixed bag of children coming back in, you know, some coming back in as though they're never being away, sort of slinging their bag down and getting straight into it. Um, but lots of needed, you know, extra support and they all needed sort of varying levels of support, um, readjusting these new routines as well. And um, we're, now we've got a new set of new routines too. Um, and so, you know, and others were really anxious about the virus and, and still are too, you know. But I think as a group, we sort of co-constructed a new normal together and we worked on being really supportive of each other, um, the children and also in our colleagues most of the time. And I think what we did is we made some really special memories, sort of celebrating the experience together. Um, and also we made some beautiful art. So that was cool too, that went home and, you know, I would see it sort of later on in the year too, <laughs> behind them in their Zooms when we went back into lockdown. Um, and little by little, because it was the beginning of the year, we did move back to that more academic work and routines, but we really took our time getting there, you know, two or three weeks at least before we even started to think about a guided reading group or a writing workshop or a maths problem solving activity or whatever. But today, the same sort of mixed bag, really early days, same ones coming in as though nothing had happened, others needing to do a lot of very careful tidying and sorting and re-establishing themselves in the room, and others sort of a bit sad too, you know, they missed their sister or they missed, you know, something that had, had been lovely about lockdown, you know. Um, had a really lovely activity we did today. I actually stole it from my, my friend, my new neighbouring friend, Anne-Marie. Um, I had an idea in mind and I saw hers and I thought it was better. And it was, she did um, emojis. So, and, so they wrote their names and then they put all these emojis in depending on how they were feeling. And it was really cool because I could go around and say, oh, what's that emoji? Why is that one in there? And they could explain, oh, I was really sad. I was really angry. I was feeling this and that. I was really loved. I was sort of feeling a bit puzzled or whatever it was. Um, and I had one thing and I wrote it down because it was just too perfect. Um, they, in this little, little sewing circle, I had this little boy doing his drawing and doing his emojis and just sort of casually mentioned to the guy next to him, you know, it feels like back to normal when you don't think about it. 
And um, it was kind of cool. And I was thinking, well, it's not that we don't have, we can think about it and it's good to think about it. But I quite liked how he he recognized that, ah, oh, we're sort of just, we're sort of just back to it. It's really fantastic. Um, and so, yeah, it's early days. So I, I actually want to finish by saying I've got my own questions for Carol and Peter. Um, my experience was that there were children that came in a little later last time and will do so this time too, and they miss that kind of gentle art-focused start. Um, and, you know, what, what, how, well, how do we support them? I'm interested in that. And also later on down the term, we don't have very long, but that's when we noticed last time that the wheels could fear, fall off a bit. We kind of came together and we got it going and it was gorgeous and lovely. And then it was actually later that we saw quite a few behaviours and sort of the emotional regulation got a bit wobbly. So um, I know you're probably going to say that it's to do with just keep doing it, which I agree with, but I'm interested to hear your perspective. So no data, tenako, 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 tenako. Well, kia ora, Marie. Thanks for, so much for that. And yeah, let's. we are moving into questions now. If people have questions, um, and there are some posted already, we'll try to get through as many of those as we can in the next 10 minutes. Uh, but you can post additional questions in the Q&A. There are a number of questions that are kind of around that, that area of you know, students who haven't returned to school yet, um, students who may not return to school. But let's start off with Marie's question about, you know, so we, we will have a staggered return of students and, um, you know, and I suppose schools will be considering maybe adopting some of those ideas and having a pathway back to more normalised work. But what would your advice be around how to deal with a, a staggered um, return? So we, if we can start off with Carol and Peter and Linda, you might want to say something about that as well, I'm sure. Carol, you're, wanna, you're unmuted, I'll, you can go. <laughs> I'll start. Um, I mean, what you're saying is exactly what happens, as I say, and all the kinds of things that I've looked at. But if we go right back to the Canterbury earthquakes. Um, in some schools, students we were in the community and they were living through it every day. And in other schools, uh, they were sent, you know, down to the Holiday House in Wanaka or up to Nana in, in Napier or whatever. And they missed that that processing and when they came back to school they were much more anxious than the students who'd lived it every day and done exactly what you were talking about um, had kind of made their own sense of it through their engaging with their families or when school started again and so on so uh, it, it's it's what you're describing is exactly what you would expect so how you need to think about it is that as each of those children come in, you use the ones who already are a little bit more skilled at being able to do these things to help them re-engage. And uh, one of the activities that uh, a school did last year was when students came back, um, yeah, for those of you who may remember, I wrote a series of books about a bear in lockdown. And one of the schools decided that when a child came back, they would use... Uh, the, the other children to explain to the bear how to do the things that you had to do and what have you. And so the bear became this kind of conduit between um, what some children knew and what other children didn't know and so on. And they, they just had this lovely way of making sure that everybody sort of came on board with feeling safe and being able to talk about things and so on. So yeah, use whatever you've done and use your, ch your children as kind of experts to help the others find their way through until everybody kind of gets back to that, that same place. So. That's my advice. Thanks. I might jump to Linda because uh, no, Peter, you go. You've unmuted. Let's let's hear. Sorry, Linda, too quick. But <laughs> oh God. <laughs> to make you to a Tara, if you're going to use that resource, what's lovely about that? It's a little kindness goes a long way, and it's the story of of the the to a Tara is really sad and can't get himself out of his funk, and the only way that he can get himself out of the funk is helping others. Mm. And so it's a gorgeous story for, for exactly what you're talking about, you know, of, of how do you help others who are coming in who might be feeling dislocated and all those kinds of things. So I think that's really important. You know, in crisis times, uh, when it's really tough, it's really easy to, be, to, to live together. You know, as a nation, we're finding it really difficult in some aspects to live well together. And that's been reflect, that will be reflected in our schools. We will see 
all those other kinds of things play out in lots of different ways. You know, the greatest of all the arts, you know, Bertolt Brecht, a great theatre writer, said the greatest of all the arts and the most difficult is the art of living together. And that's why these four weeks are going to be so important. We have to be teaching again when we've seen the division and all sorts of the, the way in which it, all, all those social fabric edges falling apart, schools have to model something different. We've always been about modeling citizenship as well. Oh God, it's wonderful that us, us teachers get paid so well, isn't it, for the, for the huge jobs we do. Linda, there you go. Um, I just love the way you and Carol have captured this. I think by the time these children come back into school, there's a team of people that are there. And, you know, I think New Zealand educators are really, really good at knowing each and every child. So you'll know who to team them up with. You'll know. You'll know the right way of doing this as we gradually integrate them back into back into our, our schools but it won't be you know we've got four weeks just have fun you know just celebrate just throw some of the stuff out and just get on and have fun with the relationships with your children and actually children will help you guide the way I think in many and in, in many times so um yeah um, Peter, you talked in, in your presentation about getting alongside children and, and talking with them as they were involved, you know, create, creatively and so on. Um, there's a question about, you know, when teachers engage in discussions with students about life during and after lockdown, what are some of the potential fish hooks or unintended consequences that teachers need to be aware of? Well, if you're nervous about engaging in the real world and the, the emotional lives of your children, then, then don't, and, and you don't feel that you can cope with that kind of conversation. I'm not sure why you're teaching, but if, if, if I'm really honest, but I think it's what Marie was talking about. You know, when my daughter was a teenager, I used to get in the car with her and drive. And we'd have, we'd have great conversations, open, honest conversations, because we weren't looking with, at each other and I was busy and she was busy changing the, the radio channels. So it's, it's those parallel conversations. And look, there's a difference between being a, an adult human talking to a child about the world and not seeing yourself as a therapist. You know, we're not there as teachers to, to therapize children who are traumatized, but our job is to listen to sit with children, to hear their pain, to know what it is that they're doing. And the importance of that can't be understated. The importance of, of children having a loving, caring adult who genuinely cares about their lives. We know the difference that makes. So, yep, there are fish hooks. The fish hooks are that you become emotionally connected to the child you're sitting with. It might mean you end up in tears. Well, I've cried with kids lots of times. I don't mind. All right, we'll get see if we can get through a few more of these questions. Um, Marie and Linda, I'll start with you two on this one. Um, you can, know, I just, can I just um, add a little bit on that? Um, uh, the, the whole point of Torito Choi is, that, as a resource, is that if you are feeling awkward about these things and you don't know where to go, the way that you approach it is through not just these side-by-side -side activities that Peter has mentioned, but, but there's a whole lot in there about picture books. Because if you don't want to have a face-to-face -face conversation with a child about trauma, then get Aroha's Way or some other book and talk about how that child, the fictional child, dealt with her problems. And through that, these conversations open up so that you can feel as if you're one step removed from having, as Peter called these, these therapeutic conversations that you might, where you might feel out of your depth. So you do it through fictional um, activities and so on and say what did this person do and oh would you have done that or have you ever felt like that and so on and you get into it sort of you know in a sneaky way around so that you you you, you know how far to push and you know when to pull back so that way you, it, it's as I say it's not straight in your face so that's what these resources are there for. Yeah, and the link to the, the resources has been shared in the chat, so we recommend that people go away and familiarise themselves with that. Um, so Marie and Linda, um, you know, someone's commented that 
for children they've had a very disrupted time and for many of them actually there's an appeal and a safety and a security that comes from going back to some kind of normality um, routines familiar familiar work and subjects so how do you balance the 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 two things we're talking about here giving children that that's kind of security and normality but also being open to um to exploring some of these these ways of supporting them yeah i mean just a bit of an adapted version i think you have to be really flexible i know last year um my kids loved doing handwriting i mean i didn't care whether they did handwriting or not but they loved it, it was really soothing and it was routine and it was very uh, you know so we did handwriting as well as all these other things I would include some of those normal routines as well. But, you know, split your day up a bit, I guess would be my main advice. What about you, Linda? Or oh, you're on mute. Um, I, I think I agree with you that actually, I, I said before, you know, people know their children. So you'll know the things that actually uh, are the, the important things for the, the must do's, I guess over the day that actually helped to create that stability. So just do it, you know? I, I'm, with, I'm with Marie on handwriting, I couldn't give a toss. But to be perfectly honest um, with you, if, if kids enjoy it, well, go for it, go for it. There's, you go, Peter. Can I, can I just add, I think there's a difference between rhythm and pattern of life and routine. And just going back to what you did before kind of makes out that nothing's changed. So you need to have rhythms and patterns re-established, but they don't necessarily have to be, and they can't be exactly what was before. Just the social, just the physical distancing, mask wearing, all that, we're not going back to it. And somehow if you go back, you know, I, I remember when my mum died and there were, and I was teaching at a school and there were teachers who didn't have enough courage to come up and say anything to me. It was just kind of like I'd gone back to school and we just went back to the routines. And actually, it's not good enough. It's not enough. We actually have to we have to address the fact that the world's changed. And when the kids come back, we have to have changed because the world's changed. Um, we're getting near the end of our time. And there are a couple of, of themes that have come through and questions that I want to address. I'm going to kind of hold you to kind of 30 second answers on these. Um, the, the first is um, about the suitability of Torito Toy resources for a range of different age groups and, and levels within schools? Um, you'll see that it attaches itself to learning, learning outcomes cross-curricular from level one to level four. So it's designed for year one to year eight. But I also know that there are secondary schools which have picked up those resources and adapted them. The great thing about Tumiki Tuatara is written deliberately to be taught across any of the four levels. Right, and the other one I want to talk about, and as more of you might want to comment on this, is um, what about the students who aren't returning? Um, you know, is is this kind of approach applicable and how do we incorporate that into that kind of distant learn, distance learning that will be continuing for many students? Linda, do you want to start off with that one? I'll kick into that. Um, so I think the important thing around this is the connection and connection over this period of time, you will have worked out the best ways to connect with, with those children, whether it be using the phone, whether it be uh, via a Google Meet or Seesaw, whatever it happens to be, I think that's the reach out. And I know that um, teachers in, in our school are doing this in different ways. Uh, they're utilising their learning assistants to help with this too, so that the kids actually come in and can connect with those that are in school as well. So it's around keeping those connections and the relationships really strong in the best way that, that you can for those particular children. Um, even over the last little while, I've had reports of, of our kids just wanting to talk to their teacher. And actually, that counts. So if that's the way, then, then that's the way. And you can always sort of talk about the sorts of things that you're doing and, and, and ask them to, to go and see if they can, because they've been given home learning packs and they've got all that sort of stuff. So they've got these 
flashed little scrapbooks that they can do, do a drawing with or they can listen to a story. You can actually do that um, where you've got the, the devices and, and telephones. I know that it's really hard, or cell phones, I know that it's really hard um, for those ones that we just haven't connected with. And there are some of those and, you know, that's, that is really hard, but um, those are just some of the ways. Yeah. Right. Carol, do you want to? Uh, yes, I was talking to a teacher the other day and she knew she would have the students who are not going to come back to school. So she was planning, and I won't know if she's on this uh, uh, call or not, um, that they would, they would have times in the day when as an entire school, as an entire class rather, that they checked in with those who were still at home. So they would all get on their devices and they would have some kind of, um, she saw these as sort of... Um, uh, free time if you like that she would be there in the distance but those in the class and those not in the class could just have a catch up and talk about what they were doing and so on and then those at home could get get back to tasks that have been set for them um, or whatever they needed to do and those in the classroom would go back to whatever they were doing in the classroom but she wanted to make sure that those who weren't coming and she expected about a third of her students not to come um, were still part of whatever was happening in her classroom. Great. So we're near end of time. There are a couple more questions, but I'm going to sneakily, I'm going to suggest to the panelists that when they make the closing comments, I'm going to suggest a topic they make them about so I can get those questions in there. That's my plan. Um, so I am going to to, um, to just give the, the panelists just a very quick um, kind of time to, to reflect on anything that's in there. Uh, let's go in reverse order. So we'll start with you, Marie. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to say, teachers, you're the ones who know your learners the best at school. They'll look to you for your calmness and your reassurance and to guide them. So trust yourself. Give yourself permission to take it slow, make it fun, but take care of yourself as well. You know, you're going to be no use to them if your re-entry isn't a support, a, a gentle supported experience as well. Kia kaha. Uh, and now we'll go to Peter. And Peter, this is where I'm going to slip in a question for your final comment, which is um, some people have asked about, you know, students who don't, I suppose, uh, have a passion for particular areas of the arts, whether it's visual arts or whatever. And I imagine you'll say get creative about how you're creative, but um, I don't want to speak for you. So your final words. Oh, you're muted, Peter. Uh, being creative about, about being creative when you're not creative is a very creative approach, Chris, and I think it's really useful. You know, one of the things I was thinking about today, because I've talked about Teresa Toy around the world, this is a uniquely Aotearoa way to come back to school after lockdowns. There's not another country in the world that's saying to its teachers, come back through love and care. They're doing this other thing, which is catch up with lost learning. You know, they're pumping kids with, 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 with all sorts of stuff. This, you know, and I was thinking how lucky we are that we have a teacher's union NZDI, a principal's federation, we have a ministry of education that have said this is the way to do it. I mean, that's extraordinary. You know how lucky we are that we can actually do this? And, you know, they don't get to, they didn't do this in New South Wales. They had to go back and catch up. They had to do all that other stuff. They had to do that in England. They had to do it across Europe. They had to do it. In, in fact, when they went back in the United States, they went back pretending nothing had happened. So here we are. How lucky we are to be here in Aotearoa. Right, thanks, Best Peter. In the world. Uh, Linda. Oh, um, I, I'm just totally with Peter. We are liberated, and I don't think that we should ever go back. You know, I was one of those people that really cheered when we saw national standards go. This is our chance. This is a chance many of us have been dying for, where we can actually be liberated as educators, bring out that creativity, and just let it roll, because that's how kids really learn. They learn when learning is fun. And, and I think we've just got such a huge opportunity. So don't let make this four weeks of this. 
let's move into 2022 because you know this is a roller coaster we're on we are absolutely this is not going to be over in february of next year so let's just look at this as as a way forward and really liberate all those skills and strengths that you've got but in line with that i'm with marie on take care of yourself along the way because um you know, you've had a hard road over this last while. Look after yourselves and um, and make sure that you have a great break over Christmas. Just thought I'd get that one in too. <laughs> Kia ora. Kia ora, Linda. Um, Carol, the, uh, I've got a special request for your summing up. Someone's asked if you could um, go through your four themes again, but feel free to add anything else in that, you, that you'd like. Well, I was just thinking that everybody said the things that I wanted to say, so I'm glad that you've given me a topic. Um, okay, so so the first one was about the that schools being the hubs of their communities, that idea of a community anchor. And so you might want to think about um, when you're talking as a staff how you work in that way. The second one was about um, principals and their leadership teams becoming crisis leaders and thinking about how you do that on top of what you do as an educational leader. I, I call it uh, sort of zooming in and zooming out. You've got to know the big stuff, the, the kind of context and ministry policy, um, but you also need to know the day-to-day -day things and how your staff hoping and what your families need and so on. And then the third one was about um, teachers becoming more aware of te uh, trauma-informed teaching, how children and their bring with them a whole lot of other stuff going on in their lives that you and you giving them the support mechanisms to be able to cope with the small ups and downs as well as the bigger ups and downs and then the last one was and I think everyone has said this is that that um, tamariki and rangatahi will respond differently and I'll come back to Maria's point is that some of them come back you know looking like fine and three weeks later they'll put to pieces and so just that idea of being gentle and, and, and getting to know them, empathising with them means that you can walk alongside them wherever they might happen to be in their emotional roller coaster. So I'm just with everybody else. Um, kia kaha, kia maya, kia manawa nui. You're absolutely amazing. And on behalf of all of Aotearoa, thank you for what you do. Got it, Carol. Um so, yeah, thank you very much to all of our panellists. It's been great to have your different perspectives on what's such an important time, but I think such also an important opportunity, as you've outlined it, um, to, you know, to start to kind of shake things up and think about how we do things differently. Apologies, we've gone a few moments over time, but I'm sure everyone will agree that it was, was worthwhile. Um, I'm going to close with Karakia, but after we do that, you'll see pop up on your screen an opportunity um, to, to explore these ideas a little further, a conference for teachers, which is taking place on the 1st of February next year, um, Creative Schools, a something of colour, I can't remember, the, I should have done the handwriting because I can't read what I wrote down. Um, okay, so thanks very much to everyone for joining us this afternoon. Kia whakairia te tapu, kia waitia ai te ara, kia turuku whakataha ai, kia turuki whakataha ai, homie, huie, taikie, kia ora.